Listen to the longing when a child hearts are innocent. Adonai Eloheinu, Baruch Ata Elohei Avoteinu, Elohei Avraham Yitzchak Ve'Yaakov, El Hagadol Hagibor Hanora. Within your temple, O oh God, we meditate upon your unfailing love. Like your name, O oh God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth.
And Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We're here, yay! Welcome to Mishkan David Messianic Congregation. Um, for those of you who are tuning in online, welcome. Um, and uh, my apologies, we, we were having a little technical difficulties here, so. But we're here, we're online, and we're glad you're a part of our service. My name is Esther Simkin. I'm the Rebetzin and Praise and Worship Leader here. My husband is Messianic Rabbi Gabriel Simkin, and of course you're going to be hearing from him. And this is Shabbat Shalom. What a wonderful time. Are you ready to leave the cares of this world behind and get into the presence of our God and King? I hope so. I hope you are too, wherever you are. Um, we are a congregation of Jewish and non-Jewish people. We have two communities here um, that is no longer divided. We like to say that at Mishkan David, the house of God is no longer divided. Jewish and non-Jewish people at long last coming together. Celebrate the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Worship him in spirit and in truth. And, um, and to follow him and follow him the way he did things. Because when you do things the way he, exactly the way he did them, your life will change for the better. Your relationships will improve. Everything will be better. So uh, I just want to encourage you to do that because I've done it. My life really, really drastically changed for the better. My husband, I'm sure, can tell you the same thing. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the Shabbat. The Shabbat is about relationship, our relationship with our Heavenly Father and relationship with one another. We have behind here, behind me here is the Shabbat table. We have candles, bread, wine, all of the symbols, the elements the, um, that go into uh, celebrating and inaugurating this specific time known as the Shabbat. And each element on this table, the candle, the bread, the wine, all of these things, these things say something about who our God is, um, who the Messiah is and uh, what he's going to do, what he's done before, what he will do when he returns, and what he expects from each and every one of us. To tell us more about that is our favorite uh, interim uh, assistant rabbi, Thomas Orms, Jr. And uh, I want to wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Robertson. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. How was your week? I see the Shema on a bunch of faces. Oh, I like that. All right. Well, um, as usual, like you heard the Robertson say, yes, we do present the Shabbat table here on a uh, weekly basis. And the first order of business is what is known as the last act of work before the Shabbat. Um, for the last couple thousand years, our uh, Jewish brothers and sisters, the wife or mother of the home, would come and light the candles. And uh, it's a beautiful physical representation of what... Uh, was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Now, thank God we have the Ruach HaKodesh, and so we are able to truly see and appreciate all of the things that the Lord had put in place for the last uh, couple thousand years. And in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, it says that a virgin would conceive of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and she would bear a son, and his name would be Im. Anuel, which means with us, God, or direct translation, but over the years, we've come to say God with us. And so um, my beautiful bride is going to come and um, light the candles for us. And if you've been praying for me within the last week to hold the microphone closer to my face, your prayers have been heard. I will no longer have it down here. I'm going to keep it up here now. <laughs> So that our brothers and sisters online can hear me and they don't have to scream and have unforgiveness in their hearts towards me. <laughs> I, I'm trying to make you guys more spiritual. But anyways, uh, my beautiful bride is going to come and light the candles for us. You would please stand and join us in the prayer. Aukata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, esher kitshenu bilvao, vanatan lanu et eshu anushikenu, mitzivenu leolat haolam. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so, um, the light of the world 
coming in through a woman. It's a beautiful thing because uh, Messiah Yeshua declared himself to be the light of the world, and he is the light that lights every man. And so um, we have the first example of a prophecy fulfilled written 700 years before his birth um, to show the Jewishness of our Messiah, to show that Messiah Yeshua or Jesus Christ as the world knows him is as much in the Old Testament as he is in the New. And so the next prayer is the prayer over the bread. We have um, this beautiful challah here. And um, the next place in what we call the Old Testament is really uh, still very relevant today, um, is in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 is the prophecy about the city of Bethlehem. And um, the word Bethlehem is actually two Hebrew words, okay? When in English we say Bethlehem, it doesn't really mean anything. But in Hebrew, it is Bet Lechem. And that Bet means house and Lechem means bread. And Messiah Yeshua also said that he is the bread, um, and uh, his body was broken for us. And so there's a fulfillment of the prophecy that he would be born in a place called the house of bread. So a beautiful thing every single week we're able to see that even the prophecies of our Lord, uh, where he was born, how was, he was going to come about. And uh, we have matzah that if you didn't get a chance, uh, we have some in the back there. Um, and if you have a big enough piece, you can hold it up to the light, and there's tiny little holes in it. And there's brown stripes um, going beneath it. Now, uh, during the Feast of Pesach, or right before the Feast of Pesach, Messiah Yeshua, on uh, the third night, um, he uh, broke a piece of matzah and passed around the table to his Talmudim or his disciples. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And so every single week uh, when we recite this prayer, at least for myself, I thank the Lord for everything that he endured on our behalf. He was beaten for us. He was whipped. And then finally he had to carry his own cross until he ran out of strength. Someone else had to carry the cross the rest of the way for him. And then he was hung on that cross and died for us. And um, the prophecy that is fulfilled, the reason why I believe there is little holes in the matzahs in Isaiah, it says that they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. And when they needed to confirm his death, they stabbed him in the side with a spear. And so every single week when I recite this prayer, I also think to myself, thank you, Lord, for taking the punishment that I could not take for myself. And so if you would uh, please join me in that prayer. Amen. Now in English, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who issues forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Partake in his body. Very crunchy. Our next prayer is the blessing over the yain or the wine. And this, uh, obvious to some, maybe not to others, is the representation of his blood. Now, we know that uh, the Lord established that there needed to be bloodshed for sins when he did um, the sacrificial system, when he lifted up the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus. But he made a demonstration long before that. In Genesis, you will read that when Adam and Eve, they disobeyed the Lord, they believed the lies of the adversary, and they ate. The forbidden fruit, they hid in shame. And the Lord is always seeking us out, and he showed it from right in the beginning when he was walking to and fro uh, throughout the garden, calling for Adam, asking him where he was. And what the Lord had to do to cover their shame, to cover their nakedness, was slay an animal. Now, it doesn't say what kind of animal it is, but that paints a picture that sin, our actions, whatever it is, has a cost. And so... There has to be a blood atonement. And when the Lord established the tabernacle in the wilderness, the sacrificial system was meant to purge us of our conscience. And it says that the fires and the sacrifices were going on all day and all night. So that means there was a continuous 
necessary purging of conscience. And so because we're not perfect, we continuously fail. The Lord said, you know what? I'm going to improve upon my covenant. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, he said that he would improve upon that covenant. Even though he was a husband to us, he had further love and further mercy. So now we have one sacrifice. The perfect Lamb of God, our Messiah Yeshua, came and he sacrificed himself and he died for us because none of us are perfect on this walk. We are striving towards perfection that can only come with a relationship from him by tapping into the Holy Spirit. But when we do make our mistakes, we no longer have to hide from the Lord. We realize the power of the sacrifice for when you sin, whatever it is, you immediately can ask him for forgiveness. And it says we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And the first prayer that I ever received when I came into this building, I was told that my past is at that door, that when I come here, all I have to worry about is establishing my relationship with the Lord. I no longer have to be ashamed for the things that I've done. Some things, yes, I still carry regrets, but I no longer have to be ashamed because all things work together for the good for those who are called. And so if you are interested in no longer having to uh, be weary of your sin, we don't condone sin. The Lord will not bless sin, but when you do sin, you can immediately ask him for forgiveness, and he will be right there with open arms. So if you want that, please join me in the prayer. Amen. Now in English, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, as King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. The Lord is good, say amen. 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 Now, um, this next prayer is a very significant prayer. And uh, before I uh, continue with the culmination of the presentation of the table, we pause here because right now we are in a period of time known as the counting of the Omer. Okay, and so after uh, Pesach, Passover, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the Lord commanded the children of Israel to count seven Sabbaths plus one day, so that is a total of 50 days. Now, in between that 50 days, uh, it is a buildup to what is known the Lord's Feast as Shavuot, or the Feast of First Fruits. Okay, now what's very interesting is that in the Old Covenant, and in the New Covenant, in Acts chapter 10, uh, when uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was delivered onto the disciples that gathered in the upper room, okay, um, the Lord delivered the Torah, or the Word of God, at the same exact time, the same exact feast of Mount Sinai, thousands of years before that. And so the Lord is painting a picture that it has always been the Old Covenant with the New Covenant together. You have to have the entire package. You need the Word of the Lord and you need the Ruach and the Holy Spirit combined. And that is what we practice here. Um, that is what we present here. We do it exactly as Messiah Yeshua did. He is the word that um, was among us, and we beheld his glory, and he also was indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so it's always, forever and ever, going to be word and spirit at the same time. And we acknowledge that by reciting this prayer, the counting of the Omer. So if you would please join me. Ba'uch eta Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kiddishano b'mitzvotav v'tzivano al sefrirat ha'omer. In English, blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the counting of the Omer. Today is 13 days of the Omer. May the merciful one restore unto us the service of the Bet Hamikdash to its place speedily in our days. Amen. Now, again, uh, we have the culmination of the table here. And the reason why I think there's a beautiful thing, the Lord has instituted the presentation of the table, the story of Messiah Yeshua at the beginning of our service is on because of this next commandment. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, a master of the law, a lawyer, asked the Lord, saying, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he answered, what is... Found, excuse me, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
verses 4 and 5, which is the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Yeshua had in mind. And there's a very important reason why he did that. Because might in the Old, the old Covenant, the Lord asked for every fiber of your being that you fought to the last breath to uphold his commandments. And now Yeshua added mind because the kingdom is now within us. Okay, When you accepted the Lord into your heart, the Holy Spirit came and moved inside of you. Okay, And so now everything goes inward. All of our practices are inward. Self reflection, you know, self, um, you know, improvement through the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, we invite you, obviously, to ask the Holy Spirit into your heart at the beginning of our service, because the true practice of the Shabbat is establishing your relationship with the Lord. It is your relationship with the Lord is that is going to bring you to new heights that you've never seen or heard of before that will allow you to walk as the disciples did. Unfortunately, uh, misconception, a lot of the churches preach now that none of that is possible, that it died with the apostles. But we know that here to be a great lie of the adversary. Everything that Messiah Yeshua promised us that the Lord uh, wrote in his word for us is available right now. And it is our choice to tap into it, okay? And so we present the table at the beginning of our service so that you can truly enjoy the Shabbat. It says, when you make the Sabbath your delight, you will fly high on the wings of eagles, okay? And so to really uh, appreciate the Sabbath and stop from your own works, you first have to have accepted the Lord into your heart. And so we don't want you to go throughout the entire service, you know, with that question in your mind. We present that at the beginning of the service. And now, once you do have him in your heart, you establish a relationship with him. We know that he still speaks today. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you want to see miracles, if you want to be healed, if you want to be restored, we have to do exactly as Messiah Yeshua did. Even Messiah Yeshua himself was tested. He was led into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 5 after he was indwelt with the Holy Spirit so that he could show us how to walk, okay? And so we, pre we practice and we copy him to the letter. Okay, we don't believe any man's word. We only believe his word. Okay, so if that interests you, if you want to have a living, breathing relationship with the Lord, hear his voice, be used by him, be of service to him, please join me in this prayer. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kevot, Malchuto Leolam Vaed. In English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you, Lord. The next two prayers, again, very significant prayers. If you are like myself, when I walked in here six years ago, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is too many prayers. My knees are hurting. My ankles are hurting. I want to sit down already. Well, that was me speaking in my flesh. And I'll tell you the reason why is because when you start to plug into the Lord, he can show you the spiritual significance of everything because he is everything. And so this first prayer is the Kiddush prayer honoring the God of the Sabbath. And what the Lord showed me about this prayer is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, um, verses 14 and 15, if my wife uh, would please pull that up. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses is again reading the commandments to the children of Israel. And he starts in verse 14 with the commanding of the Shabbat. And he says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, thine ass, or any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as you. And in verse 15, he says, And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out hence through a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So not only 
is the Lord commanding us to rest, but on a weekly basis, He is commanding us to remember where He has taken us from. We have all been through our personal Egypts before we accepted the Holy Spirit into our hearts. So not only are we commanded to rest, we are commanded to remember and thank the Lord where He has liberated us from, because we were all slaves to sin, and now we are no longer. And so Esti recites that prayer, and it's very beautiful. And the next prayer is the Refuar, the prayer of healing, perhaps the most powerful prayer, second to the Shema in my life. And when I walked in through these doors six years ago, I was a very sick individual in every single capacity, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Now, I only received two instant healings in my six years being here. Every other healing I received was a result of my walk and the years that went by, okay? And most of the time, to receive a healing, I had to get rid of something in my heart. And every single week when we recite that prayer, the, the, the people in the land of Israel, when Yeshua would walk by, they would scream out to the Lord, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. So when you're asking the Lord for a healing, when you're asking him for uh, uh, discernment or wisdom or an increase, you're asking him for your mercy because any interaction between us and God is mercy because he is the king of this universe and we don't deserve any interaction between he and I or us. And so when you're asking him for anything, it is a mercy on his behalf to give that. And so every single week, I would ask the Lord, show me my heart, Lord. Show me the deep, darkest places so that I can get rid of it and you can shine your light. And when I would do that, when he would show me people or events in my life that I needed to forget or forgive, that is when he would show his hand mightiest. And I know that he will do the same for you. Shabbat shalom. As we praise our God and King, we say, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'ratzavanu, V'shabbat Godshor B'ahavu V'ratzon Hinhilanu Zikalo L'ma'asev V'rashit, Ki Hu Yom Tehila L'mikra Kodesh, Zechel Etziat Mitzrayim, Hivanu V'charta V'yotanu Kidoshta Mikol Ha'amim, V'shabbat Godshecha B'ahavu V'ratzon Hinhatanu, Baruch Atah Adonai Mekadesh HaShabbat, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose, and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath, with love and favor, did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctified the Sabbath. Amen. And the prayer of healing. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. For you are our praise. And bring complete recovery for our ailments. May it be your will, O Lord my God, and the God of my forefathers. That you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven. Spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. And before we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we're going to listen to the sound of the shofar. That wonderful reminder, that very, very compelling reminder that the Shabbat is all about our God and King. That without him there is no Shabbat. That the Shabbat is about entering into his presence. It's about fellowship with him. And that uh, he is the one who provides rest. That we are called to rest in his presence. Not just rest, but rest in his presence and to love him and to love one another. And also a, 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 a very, very real reminder that if you don't love anyone from your heart and um, you make sure that you don't have any bitterness in your heart, that the Lord himself also, the creator of the universe, showed you a lot of mercy as well. 
And so we must be merciful to one another and, uh, and to follow the example of our Messiah, Yeshua. As we listen to the call to worship, we listen to the call to peace, reminding us that God is not just a part of our lives. He is our life. As we listen to the call to worship and the call to peace. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us a Shabbat of rest, the opportunity, the privilege of resting in your presence and having fellowship with you. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sent the Messiah to teach us how to walk in righteousness and to teach us that true righteousness begins in our heart. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who will send the Messiah again very, very soon to take his place on the throne of David in Jerusalem, at long last ushering in a period, an eternal period of, of rest, of fellowship, of peace on earth, goodwill to all men. As Isaiah said, the Lord himself, for thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. You are the Lord of glory. You are the King of kings, and we are here to worship you, to honor you, and to lift up your name, the name of Messiah Yeshua, the name above every name in this congregation.
is my shepherd. I shall not want. We are being led not by the sword of battle, but by the staff of a shepherd who leads us through still waters and green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments are made manifest. We say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba v'shem Adonai. In Hebrew, Baruch haba also means welcome. We welcome you, our Lord and Savior. We welcome you into our life. We welcome you into our congregation. We welcome you, Lord. You are the great and Holy One. We praise you and we thank you.
We praise you. We thank you, Lord. Turn to someone. I wish somebody a Shabbat Shalom. Help somebody feel really, really welcome here.
is good to praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Thank you, dancers, for dancing. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. I tried complaining. It doesn't work. You're better off praising and worshiping to enter into his courts. And King David said, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Paul said, in his presence, there's a perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. The real shalom. The real shalom, shalom. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Seemed like a long week, or was that just me? No? Short week? Everybody was busy? Short week. But anyway, we're here, and Yeshua said where two or three are gathered. Thank God there's at least two or three people here. In his name, can we say his name in Hebrew? Love it. Yeshua. When we're gathered in his name, he said, there am I in the midst of them. And of course... He's alive, and one thing he cannot do is lie. So if he says he's here, when we gather in his name, that means he's here. And so if you don't have a close encounter with the Lord, it's not because he's not here. It's because you're not here. I mean, you could be physically present somewhere, but your mind could be somewhere else. And I like uh, the way that uh, T brought up that the Lord added and the first and great commandment, to love him with all of your mind. Because how many know when you put your mind on God, it says in Isaiah 26 and verse 3, one of my favorite scriptures, that it says that, that he will keep us. He will keep us in perfect peace. How many know in the world there's no such thing as perfect peace? But in him he will keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him, because he said, in the world you will have what? You'll have peace, you'll have tribulation, you'll have problems. Anybody here have some problems? You think he set it up that way, that you would not find peace in this world, and that that would cause you to seek peace somewhere else, somewhere, somewhere out of this world? And of course he said, I'm the door. I'm the escape hatch for this crazy planet. And the only way you're going to find peace, and of course he is known in Hebrew as the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. I remember when I first came to the Lord, I said, I just want peace. I'm looking for peace. Peace, man. And I found peace in him. And continue to find Shalom, continue to find peace in the Lord. And as long as you're in him, it's peaceful. When you get out of him and you start looking around, it's like, uh-oh, crazy planet. And uh, unfortunately, um, he did say that his return would be like the days of Noah. What happened in the days of Noah in the Bible? The world was filled with peaceful people. The world was filled with violence. Violence. And so, sad to say that as we get closer to the return of the Lord, this place is getting worse by the day. People fighting wars, rumors of wars. Kingdom against kingdom, Yeshua said in Matthew 24. Um, nation against nation, just people going at each other. And that, uh, of course, that breaks God's heart because he's our father who is in heaven. And technically, we're all, I mean, not technically, biblically, we're all brothers and sisters. If we come from the first couple, Adam and Eve, that means every one of us is brothers and sisters. And any parent, if you have multiple children, is it your favorite thing to watch your children fight each other and hate each other? So it breaks our Father in heaven's heart to see his family, his children, hurting each other and, and harming one another. And, he, you know, worse, killing, lying, stealing, cheating. I mean, just terrible what people do to each other. And no mercy, you know, no heart. You know, people are just heartless and uh, so sad. And it, it, does, it, does, it, it does break his heart to see people fighting one another. And he says things like, turn the other cheek, bless those that, that, you know, that, that use you, hate you. Just don't be a partaker of the violence 
Be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And so the Lord wants us to transition from being troublemakers. Any, any past troublemakers here? Amen? Maybe that, I see people raising both their arms. So you were really, and, 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 and Roger's lifting up his legs too. I can't picture you as a troublemaker. I mean, it was a past life or something. And, uh, and now we, we've transitioned. We're peacemakers. Follow peace, the Bible says, with all men, with which such no man shall see the Lord. And so we're peacemakers. Peace, so I don't want to fight. Takes two to tangle, right? So anyway, we're in a place called Mishkan David, which means the tabernacle of David, King David. What was so special about King David? God said, that's a man after my own heart. And so I like to, I like to receive that report, to be a person, to be, to be a, a God seeker, because the Bible says what? He rewards those that run away from him. He rewards those that diligently seek him. He rewards people that seek him. And, and what happens if you don't seek God? What's the, what's the alternative? I don't want to seek God. You die. Because without God, there's no life. So when you seek God, you live. Uh, uh, Moses said to the nation of Israel in the Torah, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he said to the nation of Israel, cleave unto him because he is your life. We cleave unto him for dear life. So since we're in a place called the Tabernacle of David, we're going to read a psalm from King David. One, I mean, the Holy Spirit picks this psalm many times, Psalm 42. And so we're going to read Psalm 42. Then we'll pray and then we'll talk about ourselves. No, we'll talk about him. When he is lifted up, he will draw everyone to himself. As the heart of the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Verse 5 goes on to say, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill Mizar. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your water spouts. All your waves and your billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me, and my prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, while they say daily to me, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Amen. I love every psalm. They're so awesome. And you can read from the psalms. It's not, you don't, you don't see religion. You see a man in a real relationship and getting real with a real God. And that's, that's what God wants. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't give a theologian. He didn't give a religious person. And that's a very intimate relationship, father-son or father-daughter relationship. And once you understand that and your walk with God, you will run away from religion and you will run away from religious people. I mean, I, I break out in hives when I see religious people. Um, it's just, it just completely, it's diametrically opposed to what God wants. He doesn't want us to be religious. He wants a real relationship with a real God. And father, a father-son or father-daughter relationship is a special relationship. I'm praying that. I'm, I'm praying that tonight for everyone here, that you would understand that and that you would call him Abba, Father, as he likes. He likes to be called 
father. He likes to be called Abba. As a parent, I can relate to that. Can you relate to that? If you're a father or a mother, you'd like to be called mom. You know, it's like I, I can't see my children going, Gabriel, where art thou, Gabriel? You know, it's like, and can you send me some money? Uh, and I, it's, that doesn't work. But anyway, let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, Abba in heaven, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua, the name Salvation. And Father, we are asking not for material things. We are asking for the Ruach HaKodesh, in Hebrew, the Holy Spirit, that you would fill us with your presence here tonight, every vessel overflowing with your life, with your light, with your love, with your knowledge, with your wisdom. And lead us not into temptation. Keep us from evil, as your word says. Thank you, Father, in heaven for protecting us, for protecting us individually, our families, that the gates of hell have not prevailed against your house, this house, your congregation, Father in heaven. Thank you for your divine protection. Thank you, Father in heaven, for your divine provision for each individual, for each and every one of us. We seek your face here tonight. We seek that you fill us with your light, with your goodness, with your presence, and that you, Father in heaven, through the Holy Spirit, invade every bit of darkness in us, expose every bit of darkness, heal hearts, heal minds, heal souls, heal bodies, Lord. We ask that you do for us what you did for them, the nation of Israel, when you brought them out of Egypt. Your word declares that there was not one feeble among them, and Father God, that's what we're praying that there would not be one feeble among us, that you would restore each and every one of us that has a heart for you, that diligently seeks you. And Father God, that you would, that you would send people here with a heart for you, Lord, with a, a heart that seeks you, Father, not for things, but just for who you are, the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of grace. And Father God, we, we obey you. We want to obey you because of the way you loved us. We love you because you loved us first, according to your word. And because you love you, you said keep your commandments. We are here to be obedient to you, to hear your voice, to be led of the Holy Spirit, to recognize your voice from the voice of the enemy. And Father, we pray that tonight, give us discernment, your voice from the voice of the adversary, and uh, lead us to still waters and green pastures, as your psalm says. In the name of Yeshua, as we, as, as we rejoice in our salvation, our Savior tonight, our hearts ache for family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, even our enemies. Father God, we wish no one to perish. We wish everyone to have their names written in heaven just like our names are written. And, and, and lift them up, Father, to sit in heavenly places even though they were dead in our trespasses and sins even though we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins in the name of Yeshua. Save them, draw them to yourself. And Father in heaven, as we look around this room and there are brothers and sisters who are supposed to be here, you've called them to be here, Father. They know who they are for whatever reason, whatever the adversary has done, closed doors, made them work, whatever, physically ill. Father God, that you would set the captives free wherever they are, that you would touch our brothers and sisters where they are, that you would restore and set the captives free spiritually, physically, that they would come to your house and brag about you, Lord, about what you have done in their lives among the family of God here. In the name of Yeshua, bless those watching on the Internet. Fill them, fill us with your love, your joy, your shalom, your peace, your light. And Father God, we thank you and praise you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment, knowing that all things do work together for the good because we love you and because you've called us for your purpose. Father God, thank you for your purpose to conform each and every one of us into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our King, our Savior, our Lord. In his name, we pray tonight the name Yeshua, Hamashiach, the world knows him as Jesus, the Christ. In his name, we pray, and the people of God said... Amen, if you agree, right? If you don't agree, tough cookies. But anyway, um, we just finished Passover. Aren't you glad death passed over? You're still alive, you're still here? We literally um, 
been passed over. We're born again of the Holy Spirit. Is that awesome? You must be born again. And uh, not much to do now in between holy days. Or there is stuff to do. How many know, how many know when you get into um, God's calendar and the feast of the Lord, according to um, Leviticus chapter 23, when you get into the feast of the Lord, God keeps you busy. God keeps you hopping for him and, uh, and keeping you seeking him. In case you haven't noticed that the cycle of God, the calendar of God, the feast of the Lord keep you constantly engaged. That's the good word. Engage with God. God wants engagement. God wants people to seek him. Not because he needs us. Because the Bible says he needs us for nothing. And, the, and it says the opposite about us. We need him for everything. Because of what he said in John 15, he said, without me, you can do nothing. And so he wants us engaged. That's why his calendar, his feast keep us engaged. And the beautiful thing is that in between Passover and the next feast coming up, what's the next feast coming up? Not first, fru not first fruits, Shavuot. You said first fruits. That's all right. I said Peter was the one that, that said to him, Show me your hands and your feet when he resurrected, and it was Thomas. So, you know, when you're up here, your mind sometimes goes haywire because everybody's staring at you, and you're like, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to be judged? And let me tell you something. There's, there's like a courtroom full of judges here, and everyone is listening to every word, and everyone is thinking, and everyone, you should be filtering through the Holy Spirit everything that comes out of my mouth to make sure it's coming from his mouth. Amen? In other words, I'm not asking you to swallow every single thing I say, although that would be nice. But it's, we're to filter everything through the Spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. Because every one of us is subject to error and deception. Every single one of us. The only one that's not subject to error and deception is, of course, God. And, of course, the Holy Spirit, who's in us and with us. So it says, let one prophesy, let one speak on behalf of God, and let the rest judge. Judge. Um, think about what is being said. See that it bears witness in your spirit, or it doesn't bear witness in your spirit. And what, you know what I enjoy? I enjoy hearing this. You were speaking to me tonight. Like you feel like you're the only one here and the message was, was tailor-made for you. And I don't know how he does it, but he does it. Because if I am hearing the voice of God and I'm speaking what he's telling me to speak, he is speaking to everyone simultaneously. And you feel, because I used, to, I, used, I used to sit on that side for a while, and you feel like the message is personally tailored for you. And it is, because he's doing it. He's doing it, hopefully, through me. That's, that's that every preacher or every teacher should be like that, is to teach and to say what God is telling you to say, because otherwise it's what you think the people should hear. And uh, just because you open up a Bible and start preaching and teaching doesn't mean it's spirit-led. Are you with me? Just because you're speaking the words of God out of the Bible doesn't mean that God told you to say those things at that particular time. So because some people say, well, it's biblical. Yeah, it's in the Bible, but God didn't tell you to say it. So don't say it unless he tells you to say it. But in the meantime, as I was saying earlier, God keeps us engaged. After Passover is this feast coming up where the thing is we're counting the Omer. I mean, who's, who's ever heard of the word Omer? We don't, that's, that's an ancient word. Like we're counting the Omer. What are we doing? We're counting the weeks because God told the nation of Israel, I want you to count weeks. I want you to count weeks. I want you to count seven weeks according to Leviticus chapter 23. And after seven Sabbaths plus one day, seven times seven, don't need a calculator, is 49 plus one day. You equal the number 50. What's so important about the number 50? Well, I don't know. But if you ever heard the word Pentecost as a Christian, 
or as a churchgoer, you hear the word Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50. In other words, the church celebrates a feast of the Lord without even realizing it's a feast of the Lord because the word Pentecost means 50, and most people don't even know what the word, or the, the word 50, actually, the, the word Pentecost means 50, and most people don't know what Shavuot means in Hebrew, which is the Feast of Weeks. But, I mean, from last week, the Lord has been showing us that when we come together, when Jewish people come together with non-Jewish people, because what's happened to the Jewish people? We said this last week. Most Jewish people, what did the devil steal from them? I mean, what do you say? That you say that most Jewish people don't believe in Jesus. That's true. Is Jesus, is Yeshua the promised Messiah to Israel? So isn't it a crime? Uh, isn't it criminal that most Jewish people don't even realize that the one that was promised to them, uh, the Messiah, the Mashiach, they rejected. I mean, that, if that's not larceny, that's grand larceny. I don't know what is. But yet, so now the non-Jewish people say, hey, we got, we got Jesus. We're, we're, we got it together. No, you don't. Because the adversary stole the commandments from you, stole the Torah, stole Moses from you. In other words, now you get the Holy Spirit, you get goosebumps, and you jump up and down and bark like dogs, roll on the floor, get happy feet, you know, speak in tongues, everybody speaking in tongues. Paul said, don't do that. I mean, we've had controversy with people here that want to speak in tongues without interpretation. 1 Corinthians 14 says, don't do that. And they do it. Well, I went to a Pentecostal church, and we all scream in tongues. So go back to your Pentecostal church, because that's not biblical. You know, gobbledygook, speaking in, in, in an angelic language that no one understands. Paul said, if someone comes in that doesn't understand, they think this is a crazy place. They'll run out of here. Paul says, I would rather you all prophesy. So if someone comes in, they can hear words they can understand, and the secrets of their heart can be revealed, and they can be ministered to. Everyone speaking in tongues doesn't do anybody any good. Are you with me? So people say, oh, Rabbi Gabe's against tongues. No, I'm against craziness. I'm against, uh, I'm against cuckoo-ness. You know, if I, I'm, I'm for Yeshua. I want to be like Yeshua. I believe in tongues. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit and everything done properly and in order because we serve a, an orderly God. We don't serve a crazy God. So if you're acting crazy, you're not acting like God. And the Lord said, you will know them by their fruit. You will know them by the way they act. Because even that one, people say, oh, I have plenty of fruit. I've led many people to the Lord. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about fruit in your life. Are you filled with love? Are you filled with joy? Are you filled with peace? Which is the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the only place to grow that fruit on your vine or on your branch is to go to the place where that fruit comes from and stay there. Because the Lord said in John 15, you abide in me. In other words, you stay in me. You stay in my spirit. And that's what this Feast of Weeks is about because this week when God, after Passover... God tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for some kind of promise. I don't think they had a clue. I don't think they had any idea what was, what was coming. Because how many know when God tells you something's going to happen, most of us are skeptical, and most of us are not believers until usually it actually happens. And they're like, wow, he kept his word. Well, no kidding. God said he's not going to lie to us. The problem is, most of the time, we don't believe him, and even worse yet, we don't wait for God. Because if you think about it, uh, go with me to Acts chapter 1. We're in this period called the Feast of Weeks. Or go to Leviticus 23 so we can read about this feast so you don't think I'm making stuff up. Um, verse 15, Leviticus 23, And you shall count unto you from the more after the Shabbat, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow. After the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, 
and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Talking about the Feast of Weeks. There's your 50 days. There's your word Pentecost. There's your, there's your Pentecostal experience. And uh, that's what God tells his disciples. Now go to Acts chapter 1 with me. So now you know where Pentecost comes from. And uh, what it's about. But notice what God says to, to his disciples in Acts chapter 1. If I can get there. It's in the New Covenant, right? It says, verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Yeshua, or Jesus, began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after the had he, through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments to the apostle whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Verse 3 is saying that he showed himself alive after the resurrection. Him, of course, according to 1 Corinthians 15, being the first fruits from the dead, being seen of them, verse 3, 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should do what? should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be what? You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And so he said, wait, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Until you receive the Holy Spirit, you have no clue. I mean, you could describe that with a million words, but until you receive the Holy Spirit yourself, which is basically the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the problem is the following with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that the way the church teaches the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that it's evidenced with speaking in tongues, which now you're putting God in a box. That means that every person that is born of the Holy Spirit must speak in tongues. God can do anything he wants to. When I, when I was indwelt by the Holy Spirit for the first time, I didn't speak in tongues. I felt peace. I felt perfect peace. So don't put God in a box and force people to speak in tongues in order for the evidence to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the other problem is that when people are said they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're like, that's it, I'm, I'm done. No. The Holy Spirit is a well of water inside you that you must draw from. If you tell somebody you're filled with the Spirit, that means they're not going to be drawing from the Holy Spirit. In other words, you're telling a person you're done, you're filled. You're No, you're not. You are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit, ready to draw from the wells of Yeshua, according to Psalm, I mean, according to Isaiah chapter 12. You're now to draw water. You're now to ask. You're now to seek. You're now to knock and ask for the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Because if you're told you're filled, you're done. If you're told you must speak in tongues, you may not even realize you have the Holy Spirit. I mean, I've seen people say, until you speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. False. That's not a prerequisite. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues and speak in tongues later. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, felt peace, and spoke in tongues much later, and spoke in tongues when I didn't know what to pray like the Bible said. And the Holy Spirit made intercession for me because I guess I got around some lousy doctrine. What's lousy doctrine? Asking God for material things. That's lousy doctrine. What's good doctrine? Asking for the Holy Spirit. Asking for the presence of God. Asking to be led of the Holy Spirit. Asking for the promises of God in your life. Because think about this. God says, I want you to wait in Jerusalem for the promise that I spoke to you. That means you have to believe what God told you, and that means you got to wait on God. Things that, can we be honest, Stephanie? Can we be honest? Most people don't believe God can speak to you today. And most people, if we can be honest, have a very difficult time waiting on God. Most of us want to run ahead of God, and most of us want to do things for God. How do you know? Um, 
Many will say to me that day, what are we going to say to God? Um, Matthew 7. Here's, here's people that ran ahead of God. Um, verse 21, Matthew 7 and 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall do what? Shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven, in order to do the will of the Father who is in heaven, what must happen? You got to hear from God. So you have to believe you can hear from God. I know many people who say, you can't hear from God. Well, then Yeshua, the master, was lying when he said, my sheep hear my voice. Or in John 16, where the Lord said, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, the Holy Spirit speaks and hears, and he will speak, and he will show you things to come. So you must believe God that you can hear from God. Are you with me? And you must wait on God, and you must do what God tells you. That's his will here. Isn't that the model prayer? Lord, how shall we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here. His will done here through people that believe God is, that believe they can hear from God, and that will do something that most of us can't do. Wait on God. Wait on God for the promise. If we, if we can be, be real with God. I'm telling you, I was praying this afternoon. He said, that's what I want you to talk about. And hopefully I'm talking to everyone. Because the Bible is very specific. Those who are led of the Spirit, they're the sons of God. How many know you can have the Holy Spirit and absolutely not be led of the Spirit? How do you get not led of the Spirit? You run ahead of God. And you do what you think is right. Are you with me? No one here with that problem, just me. So not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, verse 21, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now notice the problem, verse 22. Many, there are many that are going to say this to him. Many will say in that day, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils? And in your name done many wonderful works. In other words, what are these people saying? We did stuff for you, God. And what does he tell them? He doesn't argue that they didn't do stuff for him. He just says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. In other words, you had no relationship with God. You did not hear from God. And you did all these things in his name. You did it on his behalf, but you did it on your own. In other words, was that spirit led? Was that his will? Because it took me a while to understand this. God, how can you be so mean? People prophesying in your name. People doing wonderful works. People casting out demons. Bless them. Nope. I didn't tell them to do it. Hello? I mean, is that a mean God or is that a God that wants to lead? Either you're leading or he's leading. Either he's the head or you're the head. Either he's God or you're God. Because a lot of people say, oh, I'm led of the Spirit. Baloney. You are deceiving yourself thinking you are led by God, but you, many don't believe you can hear from God. And many um, not only don't hear from God, they don't wait on God. They're like, I'm going to do stuff. I can't, I can't wait. I'm a type A personality. Great, go for it. You're going to qualify for one of these people. He's going to say to you, what's he going to say to them in verse 23? And then I will profess to them, what's he going to tell? They say this, what's he going to tell them? I never knew you. In other words, this is, did you seek the Lord for his will? Nope. Did you do his will? Nope. Did you wait on the Lord? Nope. You did all a bunch of nice stuff. Counts for nothing. Uh, what does it say? Our works are as filthy rags before him. 
He doesn't need your help and my help for anything. Oh, I helped you, God. God helps those that help themselves. That's not even in the Bible. That's somebody that's totally biblically ignorant. People who really read the Bible, people who really want to do God's will, believe that God is, believe that he speaks, and believe that he will make, give us assignments. And he wants us to wait on who? Wait on him. Because if you're not waiting on him, that means you're running ahead of God and you're doing what you want and not what he wants. And there are consequences to that. It means you got to figure it out and you got to figure out what pleases him. I played that game. I was like, this God is hard to please. I'm doing all this stuff for him and I'm not being rewarded. I'm not even getting a recognition here. Like, I got to do more. And the more I did, I got nowhere. I was like, man, this guy's like a slave driver. I don't know who's worse, him or Pharaoh. Couldn't figure out that, because I wasn't surrounded by people that believed you could hear from God. And I wasn't surrounded by people who believed God. And I wasn't surrounded by people who were really led of the Holy Spirit. Because to be led of the Holy Spirit, you got to hear from God. you got to wait on God. you got to discern God's voice. Oh, my God. Most people hear things in their spirit. They can't tell who it is. They can't tell who's on first, what's on second, who's on third. They don't know if it's the devil speaking to them. They don't know if God's speaking to them. They don't even know if it's their own thoughts. And until you believe you can hear from God, until, until you download the written word of God, which is, which is voice recognition software, as you download it, because think about one thing that God's not going to do. He's not going to go against his spoken word, what he, already, what he already said. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why do you study the Bible? Because you want to be religious? No, because I want to recognize the voice of God. Why do you read about history of God? Because I want to know how he thinks. I want to know how he acts. So when I do hear something in my spirit, I know if it's from God or from the adversary trying to lie to me and trying to fool me. Or, God forbid, it's my own thoughts. And one of the toughest things is to discern God's voice, and another tough thing is to wait on God. And like, one of the mistakes I made was, God, give me patience. Don't pray that. I'll tell you why. Because of what it says in Romans 5. Because if you say, God, give me patience, guess what you're getting? Tribulation. Romans 5 says... And not only so, we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation works. I made that mistake. I said, God, give me patience, because I wasn't patient. I'm running ahead of God. I got plans for God. I got things for God. I got, God, you come with me. In Jesus' name. I mean, I learned from some of these faith preachers. Blab it and grab it. You know, name it and claim it. Some of, the, some, of the, some of the greatest faith, false doctrine preachers telling God what to do. I, you know what I call that now? The chutzpah gospel. It takes a lot of nerve or chutzpah to tell God what to do. Imagine a, a, a puny human being with our limited, you know, abilities to do anything but make a mess telling God what to do. I mean, instead of us trying to get his will in our life, trying to get his promises, believing the promises of God, and not running ahead of God. So I was like, God, give me patience, tribulation. All of a sudden, I got all these, all these problems that I cannot deliver myself from. What happens when you got trouble in your life and you can't get out of it? What do you have to do? Wait on God, because you ain't getting out. Because I remember, I remember this as clear as day. I'm like, I'm like in all this trouble in my life that I got myself into, and I'm trying to get out of trouble. And I, I, some of you may not be old enough to remember the black and white Tarzan movies or Tarzan program with Johnny Weissmuller. Somebody always ran into quicksand in the jungle and fell in quicksand. And what's the worst thing you can do when you fall into quicksand? And thank God I've never fell into quicksand. Move. If you move and you're in quicksand, guess what happens? You sink deeper. 
And God gave me that vision or that, that analogy. He said, you're in quicksand, you're making moves, and it's getting worse for you. And it was like, be still. I'm like, I've never been still in my life. Still, what is that? You know, be still and know that he is God. Do nothing. So what did God do when I asked for patience? He gave me problems that I couldn't get myself out of. So basically, I was like, God, you got to do something here. And, and, and if you don't do something, I'm sunk. It's over. Lights out. I'm done. And what did I have to do? Tribulation worked patience. What kind of patience? You waited on God. I was forced to wait on God. What happens when you wait on God? You let him work. What happens when you don't wait on God? You get in the way. What happens when you get in the way? You make it worse. How many know God doesn't need any help? Who needs help? And we can interfere in what God is doing, or we can get in the way and make it worse as he is doing what he's supposed to do. In other words, to be led of the Holy Spirit, think about this. I mean, the Bible says those who are led of the Spirit. you got to hear God. you gotta, you got to have to know his voice. And you got to wait for however long it takes for his promise to come to pass. And how many know that not, not all the promises are microwave, you know, ready in three minutes? Sometimes you got to wait. These people, see, if you were an Israelite, you were already used to counting seven weeks. You were already used to waiting upon the next feast, which took 50 days, which is what God wanted. He, he told them, and back in, um, you know it's good when phones go off. Oh, you, you know the devil doesn't want you to hear this message, right? Tell God what to do. Don't believe you can hear from God. And never do his will. I mean, no, that's what the devil wants from us. Um, what did the Son of God say in John chapter 4? My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. He said, I have meat to eat. He told his disciples, you know not of. You have no clue what I'm telling you. And he's the Son of God teaching us to do the will of God, which, I mean, come on, we're in the 21st century, and I, I challenge you to go to any congregation, and most people, if we can be honest, really do not do the will of God. Most people can't hear from God, don't believe they can hear from God, and God forbid you should wait on God. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, we're, in, we're, in, we're in a uh, go, go, go society that waiting on God and waiting on things to happen, I mean, we're, we're go-getters. But, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty sad. Go back to Acts um, chapter 1. Is that where we were? Wait. No, no, Romans 5. We've got to finish that. Romans 5. It says, tribulation, which the Holy Spirit's reminding me. If you've noticed when you come to the Lord, your, tr your, tr your problems get worse usually. And most people don't understand that. Why am I having bigger problems now as a born-again believer that I didn't have like before? Because this is the way that we learn patience, to wait on God. When you're challenged or you're faced with something that is greater than you can, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, that you can, you can get out of. Because there's, there's, little, there's little problems and there's big problems. All of a sudden, I noticed in my walk with God that I had these huge problems. It's like, whoa. And it's like, I, I, I'm pretty smart. I'm good looking, you know, whatever. And I know how to get out of situations. And it's like, this is bigger than me. This is like, I've never had trouble like this before. And it was like, God, I need you. It was like, I never needed God before. And all of a sudden, I'm calling on God, and I'm like, I need you, God. And all of a sudden, I'm like, is this being weak? And then people are saying, that's why you needed God, because, you, I mean, look at all these problems you're having, because if you didn't have all these problems, you wouldn't need God. And I'm thinking, I do have all these problems. Maybe I made a mistake. Jewish people shouldn't accept Jesus. 
But I'm like, I could go back to my old life. I could go back to Egypt, which is a natural, I mean, Israel wanted that. I mean, when they started having problems, they were like, we, we want back to Egypt. You know, and like, God closed the door behind them. It's like, when you're born again and you're out of Egypt, it's like you're going forward. And when you look back, you're like, there's nothing there. It's gone. It's over. All, you know, old things have passed away. All things have become new. And now I got nothing but trouble, big trouble. And I'm like, God, God, God. I become, a, I become like a God crybaby. I'm a crybaby for God. I'm like, I never needed God before. Well, that's exactly what's going on here. You're, God is setting up things in your life that you're going to need him. Because most of us come from, I don't need God. Or there is no God. Now God wants to take us from no God or I don't need God to you need God all the time. And I found through the big problems in my life that as I sought the Lord and then I had to wait on him because I couldn't extricate myself. That's the word I wanted to use. Fancy word. I couldn't extricate myself from these problems because I'm like, I'm like the escape clause king. I could get myself out of problems or trouble before anybody familiar with that. It was like, there's, there's, no, there's no problem I couldn't get out of. You know, it's kind of like Houdini. They couldn't keep him locked up. He'd escape out of every prison and every jail. Don't you wish you were like that? I would like that with trouble. I'd like get myself out of trouble. Now I got all this trouble in Jesus' name. And it's like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Now I'm like a God crybaby. Oh, God, oh, God, I got this, I got that. This is happening. And everywhere I turn, there's fire. And I'm in the middle of this fire. Because everybody likes to be, everybody loves to talk about being baptized with the Holy Ghost. But nobody talks about being baptized with fire. <laughs> they leave that part out. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. What's the fire for? That you depend on the Holy Spirit. No fire, no Holy Spirit. Because when you got fires all around, you're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. You're calling on God. What do they say? There's no atheist in a foxhole in the war? You got bullets flying over your head, you become a believer. Because they're shooting at you. And you're like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And then it's, I'm finding out what Romans 5 says. That tribulation, I mean, I mean, you got to understand how God works. Otherwise, you freak out. you got to understand how God works and how he uses things because it says all things work together for the good, for those who love God. I love you, God, so why am I having all these problems? Because you're learning through tribulation, knowing that tribulation, verse 3, works patience. We have no clue. Paul says knowing. Most of us, if we can be honest, we don't know that. When you have problems, you're like complaining to God, like, I can't believe this is happening to me. Come on now. I can't believe you allowed this in my life. I remember I got mad at God. I said, I treat my own kids better than you treat me. I've had to apologize many times because I didn't understand how he worked. It's like he was allowing these problems so Gabriel would get out of the way of God and Gabriel, who did everything before without God, if you can't say amen, say on me, put your name there. <laughs> now I would become God dependent. And I would learn this patience business that I would now learn to wait on God. Like he was telling him, you wait in Jerusalem for the promise. Now, what would have happened if somebody didn't wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father and left? I'm going back home to Nazareth. What did you miss out on? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. You missed out on Pentecost. And the, and, and, and the, and the sad part is, how many, how many people did, did Yeshua speak to in, say, the three years? Thousands? How many people waited in Jerusalem, listened to him, followed him till the end, saw him alive after his death, and listened to him, and waited in Jerusalem not many days, which was 50 days, was seven weeks. How many know when you're waiting on something, seven weeks could be a lifetime? Most of us can't even wait, uh, wait a day. God, I need an answer yesterday. He's like, you got to wait. How long? 
Not many days. Well, 49 plus 1 is a lot of days in, in, human, in human years. For people who are impatient, who people never, who persons, uh, people that never waited on God, people that never, you know, just live this way. In other words, you got to hit the brakes to be led of the Spirit. And the Sabbath is weekly practice to hit the brakes and wait on God and delight yourself in the Lord and start getting used to, would you say, of waiting on God and hearing from God and being led of the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not led of the Holy Spirit and you're not waiting on God, what are you doing? You're doing all this wonderful stuff for God in His name, and He's going to tell you one day, I never told you to do this stuff. He didn't say it was bad stuff. It's not bad stuff, but he didn't tell you to do it. Did you do his will? No. Did you do nice things? Yes. Did you do them for him? Yes. Did that count? No. What counts? When we do what he tells us. When we do what he says. When we wait on the promises of God, which is, like I said, very difficult to do. Because then tribulation works patience. And here, you know what the Holy Spirit reminded me? That's when most of us book it. That's when most of us run away. Because when the tribulation starts, that is beyond our pay grade, beyond our capabilities to get out of it ourselves, we get mad at God and we run away from God, game over. Why? My people perish, lack of knowledge. Because if you knew how God works and why he works these things and how these things work, you wouldn't freak out at your situation. You would say, this is happening in my life to work what? What kind of patience? Godly patience. Waiting on God. How many people you know wait on God? God, I need an answer? Yesterday. God, I need a confirmation. Right now. And like, like my marital counseling. People say, do you do marital counseling? Yeah, it takes two seconds. Did you hear from God to marry that person? Because if you didn't, good luck. I'll be praying for you. Because you picked your mate. You might have gotten it right. I'm not going to say it's not going to work out. But if you didn't hear from God, you married who you wanted. So then when it doesn't work out, who are you going to blame? At least if God puts you together like that woman God gave me. God, you gave her to me. Straighten her out or ship her out, you know, like. Give me, bring me another one. This one ain't working out too good. Did I talk to him like that? I'm not telling you. It could be a joke. I might have. On a bad day. It's that woman you gave me. I think Adam. Adam talked like that, right? That woman. Who, who made you do this? The woman. And the woman's going, it's the man. Or like, or like women. Men don't understand us. And there's a very a biblical explanation because men were asleep when God made women. We weren't around. When women were created, we were asleep. We woke up and go, whoa, man. Somebody else here. I was here by myself. Whoa, man. It's whoa, man. He didn't say woman. He said, whoa, man. <laughs> Scared him. There was somebody, he woke up. There was somebody else there. He was by himself. And she's kind of cute. She looks pretty good. No clothes. Thank you, God. I'm naked too, he said. Then they got embarrassed and ran behind the trees and started covering up. And there's nobody else there but them. It's true, though, right? There's nobody else there. Tribulation works. 
patience, and it continues. What happens after you have patience and you wait on God? Through problems. Patience gives you what? Experience. What's so important about experiencing God in your life? Because what, is mo- what do most people say? I don't believe there's a God. There's no God. How can you tell somebody there's a God if you've never experienced God? And how can you experience God if you never waited on him and let him do anything in your life? It's all you. It's, it's the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. Because you did everything. There's no credit there. When does God get credit? When you have problems that are bigger than yourself, that you cannot get out of, that you must wait on God in order to get out of it, then you experience the hand of God in your life, and you're like, whoa, there really is a God. Now it's not just make-believe faith, like most people, you must believe that God is. Well, it's nice to believe that God is, but it's also nice to experience God, that there's a real God that does stuff. Because what uh, what do other people say? Oh, God, he's too busy for you, which is the opposite of what the Bible says. It says that, that even the hairs on your head, Yeshua said, are numbered. In other words, God knows every little detail about our life, and we know nothing about God. He knows everything about us. We know nothing about him. Until when? Tribulation. Until we wait on him, until we experience him. What happens when you experience God? Oh, God is real. It's not some fantasy. The Bible is true. How is the Bible true? Because I experienced God in my life. What did you experience? God got me out of trouble. He is a Savior. That happens to be his name. My name is Salvation. People say, I'm saved. Well, don't you like to be saved all the time from all your problems and all the things you get into? I like him as my, my shield, my exceeding grace. I like him saving me every day. I like him saving me from being sick, from being depressed, from people that, that, that are after me. I like full protection. I like a full-time Savior. I don't know about you guys. You got saved 30 years ago. Now you're still on your own. I like salvation every day. Amen. I like salvation from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep. He's my Savior. He saved me from this. He saved me from that. I thank him for things I didn't even see he saved me from. Because how I many know stuff that could have harmed you or stuff that could have come near you, he saved you from, and you don't even know because it didn't happen to you. You know, the person that was going to come and punch you out, he got a flat tire and couldn't get to you. Because had he gotten to you, he would have knocked on your door and punched your lights out. God stopped him or her. We got women punchers, we got men punchers. And we got people out to hurt you, right? Yes, yay or nay. People hate you for breathing. I don't like you. Why? Did I say, are they doing? No, I just hate you. No, I just... Because you are, I just can't stand you, and I'd like you to disappear. Excuse me for breathing. Experience. Experiencing God. What happens when you experience God? It builds... Hope. Hope in who? Hope in God. Why is God why is God allowing these things to bring you to a place called hope? Because what happens when you're hopeless in a situation in your life? When you think hopelessness, what happens? Faith disappears. Because most people don't even know how the adversary works or how faith works. Because what does it say in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1? It says, faith is the substance or the product of... Now, faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. What kind of things? The things of God, that God is there, that I've experienced God, that he will never leave me or forsake me that no matter what I see with my eyes or what I hear with my natural ears, God is with me, and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because my God has never left me. My God has never abandoned me. 
My God continues to protect me. My God continues to love me. My God continues to be with me in every situation. And I shall fear no evil because you are with me. That's what King David said. How do you know God's with you if you've never had a problem that he didn't rescue you from? If you rescue yourself constantly and it's always you, you're God. You've never experienced God. So when you experience God, it builds what? Hope. Hope in who? Hope in God. That's how God builds faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. So hope builds faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it, it's not make-believe faith. For by it, it says, the elders, who are the elders? The people that have gone before us who live this way in the word of God. Abraham is the father of faith. What does it say about Abraham? He believed God. What did he believe about God? He believed what God told him, and he waited on God, well, most of the time, except for Ishmael, we don't count that. <laughs> what happens when you get ahead of God? You get, a, you get an Ishmael. You help God. Let me, and who told him to do that? The wife. You see, it's always her. <laughs> she tells him, I got a great idea. And Abraham listens, and they make an Ishmael because they were trying to help God. Because for them in the natural, what God told them was basically impossible, that a 90-year-old woman with a 99-year-old man without modern medicine, you know, those little blue pills, whatever guys take, they were going to have a baby, a dead womb with an alta cocker, an old guy. They were going to have a baby. That was a tough one to believe. Come on. I mean, oh, God can tell you things that are impossible. But what happens when God tells you something? All things with God are possible. Because like Jewish people say, how can a virgin have a baby conceive? Well, how does a, a woman that's, that, that's post-menopause conceive? If a woman whose womb is dead can conceive, a woman who doesn't know a man can conceive. Because all things with God are possible. He's outside of time, space, and matter. He's, out, he's outside of it. He's not subject to the laws of nature. He is nature. And he is the lawgiver. And he can do anything, anytime he wants. Whenever he wants. However he wants. Yay or nay? So if a dead womb can have a baby, a virgin womb can have a baby. Yay or nay? All things are possible with God. So for by it, this kind of faith was practiced, not just in the new covenant, was seen before. Not too many people, if we can be honest, very, you probably count them on one hand, the kind of people that lived this way in ancient biblical times. And probably you can count on probably one hand, if you go to any congregation, how many people really live led of the Holy Spirit, hear from the Spirit, do what the Spirit says, believe God, Wait on God. Now, come on now. I've heard people get in so much trouble, myself included. Why? Because I didn't wait on God. Or I didn't believe God. Or God said something to me that was so unbelievable. Like, whoa, it was hard to believe. Like I gave the testimony of this piano. When Esther said, I heard from God, I was going to get this piano. I said, you didn't hear from God. Because I said, how much is it? She said, $20,000. I said, you didn't hear from God. You're a crazy woman. And lo and behold, the piano shows up because God told her she was going to get that piano. And I didn't believe it because he didn't speak to me. He spoke to her. You get it? When God says something, it comes to pass. Even though to our, to our natural eyes and ears, it may seem impossible. But we always must remember, with God, all things are possible. <clears throat> For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Let's keep going there. So faith is a substance of things hoped for. How does God build hope? Tribulation leads to patience, waiting on God, experiencing God, builds experience. Experience builds what? Hope. Hope in who? Your ability or God's ability? 
See, if you, if you rely on God's ability, then you go through circumstances, not on your strength, not on your wisdom, but on his strength, his wisdom, and his ability. In other words, no matter what you face in your life, it's not you facing it, it's him facing it. It's him taking care of that. No matter how difficult the situation is, because nothing is too difficult for God, and nothing is too hard for him, and he can overcome anything. And those who are led of the Spirit, they're the sons of God. How do you get led of the Spirit? You wait on God. You wait for the promise. You get the Holy Spirit. Then you get the Holy Spirit. And now it's the time to learn how to walk in God and hear from God and believe God and, 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 and have this kind of biblical faith that the people that have gone before us. So we have examples in the Bible of true biblical faith. So when we hear some of this faith doctrine that is not biblical, it should, I mean, it, it should turn your stomach because it's not real. It's not, it, if you're telling God what to do, that is not biblical faith. What's biblical faith? Hear from God. What's biblical faith? Waiting on God. What's biblical faith? Hoping for the things that God tells you. Not what you believe, not what everybody else says, what he tells you in your spirit. Like you believed for the piano. I didn't because he didn't tell me. He told you you were going to get the piano. He used me to pay for the piano. <laughs> the wealth of the husband is laid up in store for the wife. Something like that. I think I misquoted that. What do you think? I'm going to call myself the wealth of the wicked? At that moment, I was wicked because I didn't believe her. And I basically like, yeah, sure, you heard from God. I heard from God. He really told me this. I was going to get this piano. I said, you cry all you want. You ain't get that piano. Women think they cry that the husband caves in, not this boy. <laughs> Children try to use that one, too. Be careful. Daddy, I want to, if you give me this, I'll be your best friend. No, you won't. <laughs> True? So where are we, Hebrews? Hebreos, Hebreos capítulo número uno. How many, how many are getting something here tonight? Somebody say, I'm learning how God works. So you don't freak out and run. Hebrews 11, 11. Hebrews 11. So for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God. Now it's talking about the, the elders that have gone before us, people that, that heard God, believed God, and acted upon their belief of what they heard from God. Now it's giving us examples of biblical faith. So we should understand how biblical faith actually works and how to really be led of the Holy Spirit. Because what are we doing now? We're counting the weeks towards this feast called Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost because in Acts chapter 2 is when the 120 disciples get baptized in the Holy Spirit, now receive the Holy Spirit. Because one thing is to receive the Holy Spirit and be born again. Another thing is to actually be led of the Spirit. How many of that's huge? Because just because you have the Holy Spirit, you know how to be led of the Spirit. And, and if you don't know how to be led of the Spirit, what's the difference between you and somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit? If you don't know how to do it and how it works, yay or nay? Knowledge is powerful. My people perish. Hosea 4 and 6, lack of knowledge, not knowing. I mean, if you have, if you have a Ferrari in your driveway and you don't know how to drive it, you're going nowhere. You better call Uber. <laughs> yay or nay? If you don't know how to drive a Ferrari, what's the point of having a Ferrari? If you don't know how to be led of the Holy Spirit, what's the big deal? you got the Holy Spirit if you're living like everybody else, all the pagans that don't have God, that are led of their own whatever will in their life. I mean, it works when you're led of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? That's when you have, that's when you're ahead of everybody else that doesn't have a relationship with God. That's why we need to strive, because what does it say here? 
by faith all these things, by faith Enoch. But notice what it says in verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. It doesn't matter what you do for God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. How does God build hope? Tribulation, patience, experience, hope. Are you with me? Hope in who? Hope in God. Hope in God's ability. Hope in God's wisdom. Hope in God's knowledge. Hope in what God does for us based on what we've experienced with God before. So without faith, it is impossible to please him. Those that come to God, he that comes to God must believe what? That he is. Question, is it easier or harder to believe there is a God if you've never experienced God? Let's be honest. If you've never experienced God, you're thinking, what God? The more you experience God, the more you believe that he is. How do I experience God? Trouble, patience, experiencing God. How? When you're in big trouble. And God saved you out of your trouble. Yay or nay? You said, wow, God, you saved me. You did this. I mean, I began saying that. I was like, God, I couldn't get myself out of it. I had to wait for you. I had no choice. No matter what I tried, didn't work. And I gave you the problem and you solved it. And I watched him do it. You know why? Because I wasn't doing nothing. I was waiting on God. And I was watching God, what he did. And I was like, he knows what he's doing. And then I said to myself a few times, I would have never done it that way. No kidding, because his ways are not your ways. And his ways are much higher than our ways. But when do you realize that? When you let him do stuff. When do you let him do stuff? When you stop doing stuff. Or you're not able to do it, because that's how I saw I was not able. Now I'm like, hey, uh, I learned. What do you do? Wait on God. What do you do? I've experienced God. So what do you do? I wait on God. Do I need big problems now to wait on God? No, I already know to wait on God. I already know how to be led of the Spirit. Why do you study the Bible so much? Because I want to hear the voice of God. I want to discern his voice. I want, to, I want to hear what he has to say. I want to wait on him, and I want to do his will here on earth as it is in heaven. Because I want to hear when I go to heaven and you go to heaven, what do you want to hear? Well done, my good and faithful servant. In other words, you did what I told you. In other words, you're going to stand there and go, oh God, I did this for you, and I did that for you in your name, and he's going to say, is he going to t- he's not going to talk like that. That was me. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. You never had a relationship with me. I never knew you. You never did my will. I mean, and how many people are going to be in trouble? It said many. The Lord said many people are going to be in trouble this way. Does that mean that people understand how to be led of the Holy Spirit? No, many people are making that error today. You're better off doing nothing until you hear from God. Are you with me? You're better off waiting on God. He sees you waiting on him. And if he's promised you something, it may not happen on your timing. Don't get mad at God. Amen? God's promised me things that happened right away, and God's promised me things years ago. I'm still waiting. I'm like, Lord. And he's like, shut up and wait. No, he didn't talk like that. I talk like that. But without faith, it is impossible to please God, to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen? Is it that good? Is it that simple? Wait. When people say, I didn't, I, I, I'm waiting on God. I haven't heard anything. What should I do? Wait some more. Wait on God. Hear from God. Do what he says. Do his will in your life. Amen. That's what the Son of God demonstrated when he lived in this world. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Good. Good stuff, right? 
Wait. What should I do? Wait. For the promise. Not many days, huh? Somebody say 50 days is a long time. Baruch Hashem. You know, the Holy Spirit reminded me in Jeremiah, you know, we always quote the new covenant, behold the days come that, that God would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house. You know, you know how long ago, you know how long it took for that new covenant to show up from the time of Jeremiah? How about 700 years about? Because Jeremiah was, was alive at the time probably of Isaiah, and that's about 700 years. That promise was 700 years away. Behold, the days come, say it, the Lord, I will make a new covenant. And then, of course, the new covenant came, and what did they do? We don't believe it. Did God say it? Yes. Did it come to pass? Yes. Is there a new covenant? Yes. With the house of Israel, the house of Judah? Yes. Did they believe him? No. Did they wait? No. 700 years, they were gone. Baruch Hashem. Some promises are fairly quickly. Some promises can take generations to come. But does God forget any promises? Anything he tells us? He forgets nothing. Baruch Hashem. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you. Continue to call upon your name, the name Yeshua. Father God, if there are people that, that are experiencing right now trouble, big trouble in their life, that Father God, that they would know that you are working all things together, as your word says, for good, because we chose to love you. And because you are conforming us into the image of your son. Thank you, Father, that we will endure tribulation, knowing that tribulation works patience. Father God, comfort those who are in trouble right now that you're trying to teach these things to. To have to wait on you, to have patience, and to experiencing you, Lord, like they've never experienced you in, in their lives. And that this experience would build much hope in their lives, in our lives, and that this hope would be the substance of our faith in you, Lord. What we have seen you do, that we believe that you are and that we will continue diligently seeking you for everything, not just when we're in trouble, realizing through even trouble that we need you for everything, that without you we can do nothing. Father God, raise up a group of people that have experienced you at a level that most human beings never have and fill us, fill, fill them with this hope, with this experience in you. Fill us with this tremendous hope and faith in you. And we pray this in the name above every name, the name Yeshua HaMashiach. The world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Shabbat Shalom. Give the Lord a big hand. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to stay and break some bread. We got some food. We got some nice food. We're going to close in worship and the uh, bedtime shmo. How wonderful to learn how to have a relationship with the living God and really experience that he does keep his covenant and shows mercy.
because you are faithful even when we're not. We praise you, we thank you on this Shabbat and every day of our lives. As we're getting ready to dismiss the service, we just want to remind you that we're going to be here tomorrow morning as Shabbat continues this wonderful 24-hour experience. We hope that you'll be a part of it and uh, join us. In the meantime, we want to encourage you to stay, break bread with one another. Uh, we want to thank all of you who support this ministry with your tithes and love offerings, with the work of your hands and, um, and the goodness of your heart. We thank you so much. We really are grateful. Um, and uh, I just want to wish you all Shabbat Shalom. We're going to say the bedtime Shema. Please, let's make sure that our hearts are in the right place, that we're not kidding ourselves, that we're being self-honesty is the first step to actually having a, 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 a close relationship with the living God. So um, I just want to encourage you toward that as we say the bedtime Shema. And, uh, and here we go. Sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed, in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto Leolam Ba'ed. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. See you tomorrow. Laila Tov. God bless you.